Okay, so we're in the book of Esther, and we gave a little bit of a, uh, an introduction last week. We're going to be jumping in. Now, the book of Esther is, is not a horribly long book, but we're not going to be going verse by verse. It's, it's largely the story, the historical record of God's interaction with his people. But it's written in a narrative form, and so we're following a person's life. And in the book of Esther, as we talked about last week, God's name is conspicuous, conspicuously missing. It's an inference like, and it just so happened, and it just so happened, and it just so happened, and pretty soon you're going, it didn't just so happen. Clearly the hand of God was in this place, and they didn't even know it. Now there have been reasons to, um, speculated, why, why was God's name not mentioned? One of the reasons, um, we know part of the source material for this was Mordecai's own records. Uh, whether he was a primary author or not. And it could be at the time that he's recording what's going on. Remember, he was still working in the court of the king, uh, a pagan king, and so it may not have served him well to contribute um, Yahweh's name over and over again, but to write it down in a way that is evident to every true believer who reads this book, look what God is doing, and still in a way that was um, kosher, acceptable to a pagan king. But what we do is we have this curious story of a young Jewish girl who ends up in the court of a pagan king, and a pagan king who it doesn't even seem to be following in a lifestyle in a manner that is at all consistent with somebody you would seek as a godly husband. And we're going to jump into that this morning, how God begins to set the stage, and how God is active even when things seem dark, even when things seem hard, even when things seem difficult, before you're even aware of his presence, that God is is there. You may remember other stories in the Bible like Moses. Remember Moses when he was looking around he ran into the burning bush and he comes up and he sees a bush and it was a light but it wasn't burning and he went to investigate what it was and the word of the Lord spoke to him and he says surely God was in this place and I did not know it. Same things basically that, that Jacob said when he, when he slept and he had this vision of the ladder going up and down from heaven and the angels just rising and descending on it. He said surely God was in this place and I did not know it. And in a lot of our life, we are ignorant of the fact that God is in the place that we are at. But we're not aware. And God is going to show his hand as he acts in the affairs of men. And we start off in chapter 1. Now, as we read some of these verses, we're going to skip through because if we were to read this verse by verse, that would be the entirety of the sermon, which is why I'm encouraging you, please go ahead and read, read with us. If you haven't yet read the book of Esther, I, I encourage you to go home and read chapters 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be this morning, um, this afternoon. Or if you've already know where we're going to be next week, and I'll, I'll let you know each week, then go ahead and read that as well ahead of time so that you can have a a better awareness of what is going on. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 3 of the book of Esther. So if you want to read ahead, so everything is very familiar when we're going back to select verses out of the chapter, you'll know it in its whole context, and you'll have a better understanding of, of what we're discussing on Sunday morning. But we start off here in chapter 1. In chapter 1, King um, Ahasuerus, um, this king, and if we were to look today, we, we talked last week, we, we think most likely that this was King Xerxes. It matches historically with, with the most continuity. There are a few people who have speculated, maybe it's Artaxerxes, maybe it's somebody else, but it really seems to line up historically what we understand about the nature, the timing, and, and just the events in the life of King Xerxes. Now, there are a few points, if you said, well, this person said and regarding King a queen, rather, a mistress, who we would assume to be Queen Vashti. How does this fit? Remember, Esther is a chapter in the life of King Xerxes. It doesn't tell what happened before. It doesn't ha tell what happened after. And, and the re recordings done um, that we have of King Xerxes, ex extra biblically, were done by the Greeks who hated King Xerxes, by the way, because he was in a war with him. But here we go. Um, sometimes I may say, just so you know, if I say Xerxes, I mean Ahasuerus in the Bible. It is not 100% guaranteed identification, but in my opinion, I think it is very, very strong. And I really do believe the King Xerxes of history is a King Ahasuerus of the Bible. And you may say, wait, 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 before I jump in, then why a different name? <laughs> well, we're speaking English. He wasn't called Ahasuerus or Xerxes in his native language, and it was translated a number of times. And by switching alphabets and switching pronunciations, it, that's why you end up with multiple names of the same king. It's also why archaeologists have such a task, trying to pinpoint the right person to the right name and line it up. But that's neither here nor there. Let's jump in. Verse 1. 
Now, in the, in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and the pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. This is quite a party, a 180-day party. And it's not just a party of celebration and, and wild merriment, although certainly that was going on. It is really a party that Ahasuerus is, is doing to show off his greatness. He is a new king. We, we know in history, at this time, he'd be, he would be preparing to invade Greece, which he did about the third year of his reign. So he's preparing, and as a new king, I want to show you, all the people are now coming under my authority, I want to show the realm, I want to show the other nations how great of a king I am. And so I'm going to throw a party like there has never been a party, three months long. Come and celebrate, and then we are going to go, and we are going to conquer those Greeks, and you can know we will be successful in the might and the majesty and the power of my own name, of our great empire. And that is what's going on. For those of you who uh, have studied history, you know how that invasion went. The mighty Persian Empire, the most powerful empire on the face of the earth at that time was humbled by some scattered, some fighting, warring, ununified Greek tribes. They have stories about it. You hear of Leonidas of Sparta. That was during this time. They defeated the Battle of Thermopylae. They defeated the mighty Persian Empire and sent them home with their tail between their legs. It was a great, a resounding defeat, a demoralizing defeat. And yet, this is before that. So there's still anticipation and boast, boasting and pride. But we know he's, he's confident, he's engaged in this partying that ex exceeds decorum and exceeds decency. And we skip to verse 5, and it says, And when these days were completed, as if 180 days of partying and boasting was not enough, Xerxes says, let's do a little bit more. Let's have a curtain call. The king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And the drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Now that's kind of a good thing. On the one hand, if you didn't want to drink, you didn't have to drink. So you could go and, and you, could, you could behave with all decency. Of course, on the other side of it, if you wanted to keep drinking, you could keep drinking. It's like, whatever you want. It was an open tap. You're not going to be judged if you do. But certainly, there was a lot of revelry going on. Now, across town, Queen Vashti, verse 9, also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. So she's throwing a party for the women. The men are in one place having their celebration. The women, she is throwing a get-together for the women of the city. But on the seventh day, verse 10, when the heart of king was merry with wine... Insert, when he had had very too much to drink. There's a lot of stories that just go wrong starting with that, right? He commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abegtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown to, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. And the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. So here's what's going on. The, queen is, the king is showing off everything that he owns. All of his splendor. All of his wealth. All of his power. And then he says, after he's been drinking, you know, my wife's pretty good to look at. Let's show her off as well. Call her over. And she, whatever the reason, we'll discuss this a little more, says, I'm throwing a party, probably a respectable party, and my drunken husband wants me to be paraded before his friends so that I can be his trophy. He goes, not coming. 
We'll talk about that a little bit more. It doesn't go over so well. This is a king who is not used to hearing the word no. He's a toddler with a crown. Well, the king is shamed, the king is angry, and he acts emotionally and rashly, and he begins to listen to a foolish counselors, and if we would go through all of chapter one, he says, what should I do? He doesn't even make a decision on his own, and all through this book, here's an interesting note. There are very few times where the king steps up and makes a decision. He lets himself be led about by various people. For the, this powerful man who is showing off all of his might and prestige, he seems to be very insecure and very easily led. Well, he says in verse 15, according to the law, what shall be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus, which was delivered by the eunuchs? He is afraid that he has lost face in front of his friends. He is ashamed. He feels like you've made me look bad and now I need to respond. He is not acting out of a sense of justice, but out of a sense of a wounded ego. And the, uh, the men begin to talk. Um, we're not saying that women, of, women today always have it well. But be thankful you didn't live back in there, ladies. Because the men begin to talk, the men with all the power. And they say, hey, um, by the way, this is a really bad precedent. Precedent, Because what if our wives don't listen to us now? The king better act forcefully. You notice everyone wants the king to act forcefully with his wife. These men who probably are not going to stand up to their own wives. And say, you need to set a really big example for us. Um, you need to act forcefully so that our women will listen to us too so that our wives will listen to us too, so that our daughters will listen to us too, because clearly you need to make an example out of her. And the king, foolishly acting rashly, adding, acting out of woundedness, heeds this advice. Verse 19, If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So what happens? Queen Vashti is set aside. Now make no mistake, the, the king, as was common of the kings at this time period, had a large harem. She was not his only wife, but she was the preeminent wife. She was the queen. She was the only one who could wear the crown, and she would be set aside, and the, the crown for the queen is vacant. She has lost her position. She is removed. Um, Rachel Evans writes, um, from a literary standpoint, the opening act serves an important purpose. It warns the reader to watch out for Xerxes and his court. Think about it. This is the background. This is the situation. This is the place that young Esther is going. A pl these guys have a bad habit of making major kingdom-wide decisions based on personal offense and whims and should not be crossed. And it adds suspense and it adds drama to the story, for we see right of way what sort of odds Esther and Mordecai are up against. This isn't just background how Esther got there. It's showing you this is a pit of vipers, big ego, easily offended vipers, who will act on a whim and are willing to destroy lives based on a minor grievance. This is where Esther, what Esther is going to be up against. But who is Esther? Let's let's. Move into chapter 2 here. Uh, oh, actually, before we get there, if, if indeed we are correct about him being Xerxes, the king, now some four years later, and there's a passage of time here, and we see that even in the verses here, there's a passage of time. He is defeated by the Greeks. He comes home, wounded pride, um, has to put down some other rebellions, and depressed, upset, and history does say, as we mentioned last week, that Xerxes spent an inordinate amount of time with his harem in drinking following his defeat, which fits right in with the story. That he comes back and he realizes, I, I don't have my queen. And perhaps he's feeling lonely. Perhaps his, his ego has been sufficiently deflated to realize that I'm just a man and I, and I have some issues. And so he... he he turns again to his advisors, and we see in, in chapter 2, verse 1, that after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done for him and what had been decreed against her. He's like, I don't like this, but I made a law, and my laws are not repealed because they're the laws of the, of the Persians and the Medes, and those were supposed to be forever. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be brought from all, 
out for the king. Let the king appoint officers in the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful maidens from the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let cosmetics be given to them, and let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and he did so. And so here we go. So what, what is the king in all of his righteousness decide to do? He gets to say, we're having a Miss Persia contest. Here's the deal. In order to enter this contest, you are now one of my wives. And, and essentially, once you join this, you're part of the king's harem. And out of all of you, whom I delight in the most, you will get to have the preeminent job, the queen. And, and what girl would really turn that down? Tell you what, we're going to go through the land. We're going to judge you only for your superficial beauty. We're not going to care that much about you. You and a hundred other contestants can be the king's wife. And if you are so lucky, you could wear a crown. And if he gets tired of you, he could dispose of you in a snap. Um, you wonder how much, how much decision was was the women in this regard, right? This doesn't seem like perhaps this was something they said, hey, that sounds like a great job for me. Now, certainly there may have been some social climbers. There have been some who have even accused um, Esther of being that way, of saying, well, I'm going to marry up. I'm a young orphan. I don't have a lot of prospects. At least I'll be well taken care of. There's been people who have accused her of that. Um, we'll get to Esther a little bit more. But chances are, a lot of these women had no choice. That They were compelled. It says, hey, you're pretty. The king wants you. You're coming. And so they're all taken in. It's, um, it's a situation that would have been very bleak. And if you can consider, if you're one of these young women, whether you were Esther or another, and saying, I'm, I'm, I'm being dragged out of my home, maybe there's another person that I wanted to marry, and the choice is no longer mine. Maybe I'm going to be consigned to a life of loneliness in, in, in a group of other wives, those other nameless wives who have a very isolated pre well taken care of, but lonely existence in a situation fraught with rivalry and infighting, likely. That even in this place, God is working. Even, even in this situation, by all the failings of man, God is accomplishing the purposes of saving lives. We, we see what happens is um, that God then, in verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, and she, he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Esther becomes queen. Esther is raised from insignificance, someone we never would have known. There was nothing about her that would have drawn our attention to her. Yes, she was beautiful, but that's all that we would have known, perhaps, but God has now put her in a position to wield influence. And so as we, as we review what we've, we've looked at, this just setting the stage of what is going to come for the saving of the people, there are some lessons that we can learn from these two women. And I want us to stop and consider what we've already looked at. Number one is look at God's foresight and power. I, I hope you realize that. This is all happening before the threat has even materialized. Do you see this? The, what we're going to get to in chapter 3 next week is Haman's conspiracy against the Jewish people. That happens in chapter 3. But in the story that we are reading, the threat has not yet materialized and God already has the rescue plan in place. Nothing escapes the notice of God. And we can take great, great consolation in that, great, have great confidence in that. We read in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, I am God, this is God speaking, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. It says, I know the future and I have declared what will happen before it happens. It's one of the... One of the mysteries and confirmations of the Bible as a fulfilled prophecies. We look at the prophecies that indicate that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and there is statistically it should be an impossibility that one man would succeed all these things because there, there's some prophecies that you could try and, try and achieve on your own. But there's some things you can't. Like who you're going to be born to, where you're going to be born, the time you're going to be born, the manner in which you will be killed. Things absolutely out of control, but God declares what will happen before it happens. He sees all things, he knows all things, and he is sovereign over all things. 
and he's always working. I, I, I don't know what Esther was thinking. I don't know what the other girls were thinking. I don't know what Vashti was thinking. I certainly don't know what King Ahasuerus was thinking. But God was at work even when no one was aware of it. Which, which mirrors the statements of Jesus Christ that Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. He says, you may not have noticed it, but we have been at work. This God has been at work. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, we do not rest. We are active in the affairs of man, in the hearts of man to draw people to us. To God. First Samuel 2.8 says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts a beggar from the ash heap. To them he sets him among, among princes and makes him inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. God is powerful and he is active and nothing escapes his notice. And I hope if, you, if nothing else this morning you realize that. Just because you don't know what God is doing doesn't mean that he is not doing. God is at work. And we need to pray that he would involve us in his work and that he would show us how he wants to be a part of his work. But do not doubt that he cares and he is working. Well, number two, we have lessons from Vashti, this pagan queen, and according to some his extra-biblical sources, maybe not the nicest of people, but there are things that we can learn from her that are very good things that we can learn from her. Here was a woman who was given a request, a request to be paraded before a drunken party to display her beauty. This is not, this is not an empowering situation. This is a demeaning request that her husband made of her, a foolish request. Um, the king is vainly wants to show off his prized possessions, and he labels her as one of his prized possessions. There are some who have even said it might have even gone beyond this. Now, there's, it's reading between the lines. There's not a lot of substantiation, but one of the Jewish, um, ancient Go Jewish commentators on this passage said, it may be, just put this up as maybe, possibly, not for sure, it may be that Vashti refused because she did not want to be put on display, but it may have been said when he said, I want to see Queen Vashti wearing her crown, that it may have been wearing only her crown which would really change the tenor of the request. Queen Vashti, my friends want to see how beautiful you are. Come wearing your crown and only your crown. And that is possible. Um, this man does not seem like of the highest moral character. We have seen that up till now. Whatever the situation, whether she just didn't want to be paraded before a group of salacious drunken men, or whether it was something more, even more demeaning, she rightly refuses. I believe in my heart looking at this, she rightly refuses to come. She has an obligation to host her own party, which the king should be aware of. She does not want to be paraded in an indecent manner, and she does not come. It's likely that she would have been humiliated in some way. Um, it's almost assured the king did not have noble attentions in showing off his wife. Um, and, in her in, and so she declines the invitation. So she refuses his ignoble request, and she's got to be aware. I'm, I'm assuming she's not naive. She's grown up in the court of the potential fallout. Now, perhaps she was prideful. Perhaps she thought she was not replaceable. Perhaps she was, indeed, unaware of what could happen. But she stood firm. She did not go. And the question is, if a pagan queen can see something that is obviously unpalatable, not right, and say, I will not go, it should, it should challenge those of us who do have a relationship with the eternal king to make sure that we know what is right and what is wrong. And when we say, we will not go because it is dishonoring to me, because it is dishonoring to my Savior, that we, we can also have that same conviction to stand firm. Will we, what will we do when there's a choice to follow a command or to follow the crowd and that call would bring us into dishonor? particularly into things which dishonor the Lord. And the truth is, we might face consequences. We could. All through the Bible, we see people who had to face consequences for doing what's right. All throughout history, we see people who have had to suffer for doing what is right. In Daniel chapter 3, the famous story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego facing King Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, if you do not bow to this idol, which was clearly a sin, then I will throw you into the furnace. That, that's persecution. Not of the mild sword. But how did they respond? Verse 17 of chapter 3 in the book of Daniel. If that is the case, 
Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Will we have that same courage? Will we have that same conviction? Will we have that same ability to stand firm, even if it costs us everything in this life? It's something we can learn here. And in the middle, middle of facing these choices, we need to remember the words of the Lord that he has given to many people over and over, including Joshua, kind of the penultimate example of this. Joshua 1.9 where he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Um, so many people do the wrong things because they're afraid. There's lots of things to be afraid of. Loss of a job, loss of a relationship, loss of respect, loss of life. But we need to stand with courage for Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, we read, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. And again, in 1 Peter chapter 1, we read, In this you greatly rejoice. This is Peter writing to Christians who are going through a very difficult time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than the gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what did, what did Peter just write? He says, I know you're suffering. I know that standing firm for Jesus Christ is costing you, but your faith is of greater value than gold. And the character that will be revealed before God is the truest riches you could hope to attain. Stand firm. He says later in the letter in chapter 3, verse 17, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now he doesn't say it's good to suffer. Note that. But if you're going to suffer, it's better to suffer for doing good. So stand firm. Be brave. I mean, how many of the histories of the, in, in all of history and in all of the Bible, the heroes of the Bible, how many men and women do we remember exactly because they were willing to stand firm in a difficult time? We don't remember the people who capitulated, who gave in, who ran away. But rather the people who were willing to stand and be accounted when the tests came, when the trials came. And then, and we're going to get to her a lot more, so we're not purposely slighting Esther yet. The rest of this book is going to be about Esther. But then there's Esther. She's in the right place at the right time. Sometimes in our life, I know sometimes in my life and through many of you through conversation, you just go, I just don't know what God is doing. I have no idea why I'm here. I don't. I don't get it. And sometimes God, not in an audible voice, I've never heard that, kind of would like that. I think I would like that. <laughs> Um, after, after I, I don't know, fainted dead away, I'm sure. But I, God, God seems to say to me, it's not for you to understand. All will be revealed in its due time. It's for you to be faithful. So we may not understand what he's doing at the present moment, but he's, he's doing things. And Esther, at this point in time, may be saying, this isn't the life I planned. Why am I here? I don't understand, but God is at work and she is in the right place at the right time. I already said it was likely that she had no choice in the matter, that she was taken passively and just taken into the king's palace. Um, when you see her character throughout the rest of chapter 2 about how she responds to the king's officials, you do see some character qualities that would lead you to believe that's likely the case. She seems very submissive. She has a beauty which is not just outward, that people seem attracted to her by a, a sweetness of her spirit. So I would say it does stand to reason that it is likely that this was not her plan. But even if it was her plan, let's just go, you know, play devil's advocate for a moment. And she was a little bit of a social climber and said, this is my chance to be queen. And I have to make some moral compromises to get there. Maybe she was a girl who had forgotten her religious roots and was growing up as a secular Jew in a foreign kingdom. And maybe it's not till later on when there's a crisis that she'll return to, to uh, her faith. We don't really know. The Bible doesn't let us in in terms of her inner thoughts up to this point. But even if that is the case, 
then whether it's in a suffering, sorrowful situation, or whether it's in a situation where she is willfully ignorant of God, God is still working. And he has her there for a reason. For a reason that will benefit her, but even more that will benefit others. And it starts, it starts right away at the end of chapter 2 that God has placed her in a position to save her people. This detail, what we read at the end of chapter two, almost seems like just a tag on, a few verses that are insignificant, at least initially in the reading. But her cousin Mordecai, by the way, Mordecai was the one who was raising her. Her parents had died, she was an orphan. She's being raised by this, this near relative. He works at the king's gate. He's, he's an um, important official. But it says that in those days, Mordecai sat at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Thin and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. That means they wanted to kill him. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Even at the outset, early, early in her reign as queen, which is more of an ornamental title, but she has the opportunity to preserve the life of a king because God has placed Mordecai, her relative, in a position with access to her, his relative, to inform the king that his days may be prolonged. We may see this king and say, why would God want to prolong the days of this king? He doesn't seem like a very likable fellow so far. He doesn't seem like a very godly man so far. But remember, we don't know who would be king after him. And as we're going to go on the story, there are people this king may be a bit of a lech, but he seems morally ambivalent towards the Jewish people. And he's going to be able to be led in the right direction. There are certainly others in the kingdom who hate God's people and would take a more active role to persecute them. And God is going to let this man, flawed though he is, serve an important role, even if he is a bit of a pawn, in protecting God's people. All this happens, everything we've read here, in anticipation of, of the sovereign, providential, and working hand of God. You know, it's, it's one of the things about, about God that human beings can't grasp. We try. We try our best. But it's trying to put, put the eternal mind of God into a two-dimensional playing field. You know, see people trying to go, well, we're trying to put the logical order of providence and salvation and everything into a neat little box that we can tie up neatly. But some things are just too marvelous for us and too great for us that we cannot fully comprehend the mind of God because we are finite and God is infinite. And trying to say, well, what came first or how does this all work? We, we have to be, have at least some honesty in the situation and say, we cannot fully understand the mind of God because it is beyond us. We can have an appreciation for what God is doing and we can have a remedial understanding of how he works. But to view it in its completeness um, would be arrogance or hubris on our part to say we fully understood how God worked. But God is working. And it's this great mystery of how God can use the agency of man. That's people's choices. And some of those choices, even foolish or sinful, and still bring them into perfect alignment with his good purposes. We see it all through the Bible. We see it in the fall of man, and yet the redemption that is, is brought about through Jesus Christ. We see it in Joseph with his brothers, how Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery, and they hate him, and they want to kill him, and God uses it for their redemption. And we see it here in the book of Esther, how this king is making horrible choices, and yet, in, out of these choices, God is going to bring something beautiful. Because God is a God of redemption and providence. And though we may try to steer, steer the train off the tracks, it always ends up back on the tracks. It doesn't mean that we have no choice. It means that God is sovereign in spite of our choices and through our choices and works with us to bring glory to his name and bring his purposes into alignment. And we know the, the end of the book is written and it will come to pass because God has decreed it and he is on the throne and what he promises will happen and what he decrees will indeed come to pass. And so we can know the hand of God is always at work and he's working in our lives as well. And so if you think you're in an uneventful, quiet time, Maybe, maybe the foundations are being laid for future action. Don't waste the time. Get to know God. Read his word. Be prepared. Just as a farmer goes out and plants the seeds, and we've used that illustration a lot of times because it's, it's so relevant, and it, it's such a strong correlation. You say, God's not doing anything yet. Then get to know him better. Pray. Read his word and ask him how he might use you. But be prepared for the opportunity for when it comes knocking. 
Maybe you think this chapter of your life is insignificant. These are just the filler pages. I don't know what to write, so we'll just write down, and I went to work every day, and I went home every day, went to sleep every day, and repeated the same thing every day. It may feel like nothing important is happening. But once again, don't waste the time because nothing grand is happening. Serve faithfully in preparing for what might come. And also be aware that sometimes the little things that do not seem, ins- not seem significant to you are grand things in the scheme of someone else's life. Some of you have had a silent witness that has strongly impacted a neighbor, a friend, a relative, and you don't know it. And you will not know it until the day you stand before Jesus Christ in glory. And you'll be like, God used that? I did not even know that was important. I've shared before, I've had conversations that I don't remember that people have told me, said, that was really significant what you shared with me. And, and, and you want to go, I have no recollection of that. <laughs> but I'm really glad that God used it. But that, that's how God works, does he not? Sometimes the insignificant things in the hands of God become the great things, whether they're fishes and loaves or whether they're your obedience. There was a, Bob, um, Bob Christopoulos and I were talking just yesterday, actually. There's, there's a pastor who resigned his pulpit because he was discouraged because he was having no impact. It seemed like filler space. But what he failed to realize is the one boy who came to faith that previous year before his resignation was the same William Carey who became the father of the modern missions movement. It seemed like God was doing nothing but was insignificant in his own eyes became something great in the hands of God. So be faithful in the quiet moments, knowing you may be being prepared for something greater, or it might be that what you are doing will be something great down the road. And trust that God is working. Seeds are planted long before they bear fruit. But let's seek God in his work and seek to be people of conviction and confidence who are faithful to him in every circumstance, whether great or small. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to look at the life of Esther and to see your hand, which is hidden from so many because, because your eyes are not open, are not open to see it or to recognize that you are there. But I pray it would not be so with us, but as we, as we engage in the study, as we engage in our lives, that you would reveal yourself to us in our hearts and our understanding and that we would be led by your hand, not only to do works for you, but to be drawn into a greater relationship with you, to love you more, to, to understand you more, and to know that your love for us is beyond anything that we can understand already. Thank you for this morning and just the blessing of coming together and seeing what you're doing. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.